didn't really pay much attention to what I was eating. And, you know, initially it's not a big deal, but over time I started to have some, quite a few chronic uh, illnesses, which um, after uh, seeing a natural therapist, a naturopath, and a number of other people, and going back to school, I discovered nutrition was a big component of getting well. And I had had to heal my gut and repair my gut first and, uh, and um, eat differently. And that was definitely a process and a journey because, you know, uh, the foods I ate, I didn't, weren't necessarily uh, foods that loved that my body loved, right? I mean, I loved it, but um, there were some serious side effects. So uh, I went back to school in my mid forties or mid to late forties to study holistic health, nutrition, and all of the aspects of health, because certainly nutrition is not the only aspect, but is certainly the building block, the foundation to, um, to a good, to good health. And um, it took some time. To, to transition to the way I eat today, but um, I am so grateful that I, I went back to school to do this, and now I'm so passionate about what I do, and I can talk to people all the time about food and nutrition, and it never gets old for me. And I've seen, the, with the clients that I work with, I have seen so many people reverse chronic conditions that they didn't realize that they could reverse. You know, type two diabetes is so common these days, and just with changing your diet, uh, it, you can reverse it and stop taking the medications. And of course, I always recommend that you do that you know, being followed by a doctor, but it is totally doable. So um, I have been, I shouldn't be surprised anymore, but I am still surprised at times um, when clients report back to me the progress that they're making and the changes they're noticing. So. Today I am going to focus primarily on the brain and brain health because if your brain is healthy, then the rest of your body is going to be healthy. And so, um, but it starts, always starts in the gut. So we have to have a healthy gut, to have a healthy brain, to have a healthy body. So I am going to just pull up the um, PowerPoint presentation. I will try not to kill you by PowerPoint. And uh, I do have, well, I don't know what it is. Uh, did there, but we'll try that again. Did I not select the right document? There it is. As you can see, uh, technology is not my forte. And there we go. So I've introduced this. Everybody can see that? Okay. So Yes, thriving in challenging times. We are definitely in challenging times. The first thing I had to learn how to do was this uh, when our office was closed for four months. And so I quickly transitioned a lot of what I do in terms of nutrition online. Uh, I do one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations with clients and a variety of different things. So um, it's working. It's, I'm still learning, but it is, uh, it is working. So the next six sessions that we'll be doing will be every two weeks. And so today, while we're talking about food choices and brain health, we will, as time goes on, talk about the different challenges that we have, especially given our circumstances right now with work and studying. I do find it much more challenging, um, not just with food, but trying to maintain a good mental health because sometimes I, I just feel so sick and tired of everything that's going on, but this is our reality, right? So while I might want to, to binge or eat some foods that aren't necessarily that great for me, I know I have to take extra care of myself these days uh, because of our circumstances. So we'll be talking about over the course of the next six se sessions, the different challenges that we might experience right now with studying online, social distancing, how that affects us mentally, emotionally, what we can do about it. The toxins that we're also being exposed to that we might not be aware of that is also affecting our, our brain and what we can do about that. We will be talking about how to develop some kind of an individualized plan for yourself so that you can develop a routine, not just with uh, food, um, but other, other things with sleep and different 
perhaps meditation techniques. And of course, we have to talk a little bit about movement and exercise. And just all of the things that we want to do to, to have a good, a good year in spite of the challenges that we're having. And hopefully, in the process, um, have improved health mentally, emotionally, physically. I always talk mentally, physically, emotionally because we are a whole body with a mind, with emotions, with feelings. And so we have to um, address all of it. But food, for sure, I have seen is the, the primary foundation for good health. And of course, I'll be talking about supplements and herbs and other things because we're all coming here with different challenges in terms of um, where we're at. So we'll be talking through the, the next six sessions. Uh, I'll be talking more specifically about those things. And I would appreciate some feedback. If there are some specific challenges that I'm not covering, maybe an email to Mike or an email to me, and then I can incorporate that in some of the sessions. Um, because again, we all have different backgrounds, we have different challenges. So. Um, I am happy to help you out, that's what I'm here for. I'm very excited to do this. So the uh, one thing that I have definitely learned is that food is medicine. And it seems like a simple, basic principle, we hear it all the time. But I have experienced what food has done to me when I'm not eating the best of foods and the healthiest of foods and how sick I became as a result of it. And I have seen the transition when I went from eating um, foods that I don't even consider foods anymore because it's really what the food industry has created that is destroying, destroying our health. So food can most definitely be a very powerful form of medicine or it can be poison and while we may not feel the uh, our bodies may not react to those foods right away the, the not so healthy foods right away it will eventually catch up to us and one of the things that I have come to realize is that for many years we were eating foods that we didn't realize were loaded with genetically modified foods and um, things that are very detrimental to our brain. So that's kind of what I'll be talking about, the foods that are great for us and the foods that are not so great for us. Uh, so it's kind of a nutrition 101, and at any time, if there are any questions, although we'll have some time at the end, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to field those questions. So we are made up of cells. Our cells contain all of our DNA, and we have, last count in February this year, I was doing some research, uh, over 100 trillion cells. And out of those, we have 200 different types of cells and we have you know, 80 known organs. I find it pretty cool and fascinating that there's so much study being done now on the body, the impact of foods on the body, on our system. And food is being used a lot to treat a lot of different conditions. Um, specific, even autoimmune diseases are being treated a lot with food and diet, eliminating certain things, incorporating other things. So it's, I, I, I'm a geek, I'm a total geek, so I love that stuff. <clears throat> so why is it important um, to know that we are made of cells? Well, the quality of the health of those cells is completely determined by what we eat. Um, I shouldn't say completely, probably 75% determined by what we eat. And then the rest is determined by our environment. Epigenetics is a new science, it's about 30 years old now, and it says that depending on our environment, so that's where we live, um, who is around us, the type of influence we have, what we eat, uh, what is our mental state, mental, physical, emotional state? Are we active? Are we exposed to toxins? That will determine our health more than our actual genetics will. And the, the food, the environment and the food that we eat will either turn certain genes on or off based on our food and our environment. So, I mean, that's kind of good news, bad news. It's good news because that means we have control over health more than we thought because we used to think that genes controlled our health. And only 5% of genetics is truly 
a genetic where if you have that gene, it's a pretty good chance you're going to get that disease. But the rest, uh, we have control over. So that is, um, that's really good news as far as I'm concerned. Um, because it puts the power in our hands, which again is the bad part, because then that means you have to take responsibility for, for what you eat and your environment and what you do. So moving on to what do we eat? This is where the nutritional 101 comes in. There are um, three main macronutrients, three macronutrients that we want to, to eat to stay healthy. The first one being complex carbs. Uh, complex carbs are the carbs, carbohydrates that are the fruits and vegetables that have fiber and all of the vitamins and nutrients that we need to stay healthy, vitamins and minerals. Of course, that depends on where we're getting our fruits and vegetables, and unfortunately, the soil has become very depleted from nutrients. So, um, we we do want to try to have organic produce as much as possible, but of course, economically, that's very difficult. There is a list uh, that you can look up. It's called the Clean Fifteen and the Dirty Dozen. And it is a list of all of the foods. The clean 15, of course, are the foods that are not sprayed with pesticides that you can wash off. Any herbicides or pesticides that may have been on there. And then there's the dirty dozen, which are loaded with pesticides. So those are ideally the ones you want to buy organic if you can, but of course, if you can. Um, so we want to be eating the complex carbs in a variety the we always talk about the rainbow colors and there's a reason for that different produce different vegetables different fruit depending on their color primarily contain different minerals and vitamins antioxidants and uh, just of note when it comes to our brain while um it's only one organ out of 80 it requires 10% of our nutrition to function properly. So that means what we eat is pretty important with regards to, to nutrition. So the dark fruits, I think we hear it all the time. The berries, they are very high in antioxidants. They help with inflammation. And we think of inflammation as being topical sometimes or achy joints, but it's also, it also applies to our gut and to our uh, brain. Food does very much directly impact our brain and cause inflammation if it's the wrong kinds of foods. So here, Mother Nature is so smart, I tell you. Um, here is a list of the different color code, the rainbow of the fruits and vegetables. And, and Mother Nature has designed it so that certain colors very specifically address different health issues. So as you can see, uh, green fruits and vegetables detoxify, orange helps to prevent cancer. And like I said, a lot of research is going into the foods that help to support um, cancer patients and, and other conditions. Heart, heart health, um, blue and purple promote longevity. And uh, white immune boosting and yellow for the skin and eyes. And right now, because of the challenges that we're experiencing, uh, with the isolation and all of the regulations that we have, the restrictions that we have, our immune system is being seriously compromised, not just because of the anxiety that it creates. And as soon as there's stress and anxiety in our lives, our immune system is being challenged. And so more than ever, eating the right foods is that much more, that much more important. Um, so let's see. So if you're having any challenges specifically, uh, maybe consider, go to this, um, this little chart and see as an experiment, experiment to see if you find a change with, um, with your skin or your eyes, for example. But I would always suggest that you eat um, all of the different colors. And obviously we can't eat all of the fruits and vegetables all the time. So I'm always rotating. I rotate fruits, vegetables, I use different foods. And that, um, in that way, I know I'm going to be eating everything that I should be eating. So now, um, the other two macronutrients that we need to be healthy are protein 
and fat. Protein can be animal protein or it can be plant-based. Uh, if you are uh, vegetarian or vegan, there are lots of plant-based proteins. And so a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the fruits and vegetables, vegetables especially, do have some protein and some fat, some more than others, like avocado, for example, has lots of fat and protein. Nuts and seeds, of course, are high in uh, fat and protein. Um, legumes are high in protein with some fat. Legumes are not a whole protein, but if you combine that with other vegetables, it becomes a whole protein. So certainly there's, uh, everyone has a different dietary need in terms of do they do better with a vegan or plant-based diet? Do they do better with more protein or a little bit of both? So I don't advocate one over another. I've definitely seen where some people do much better um, with regards to having more plant-based foods in their diet and some not so much, but everyone is different. So I never, I don't, um, I don't advocate one more than another. There are things that need to be considered one way or the other. If you're eating protein and it's animal protein, you don't want to be eating too much red meat, for example. And if you're on a plant-based diet, then you definitely want to make sure that you're eating lots of the right um, complex carbs and not so much the simple carbs, because being vegan does not necessarily make you healthy depending on what you're eating. And then the other uh, is the fats. And fats have been demonized for quite some time. And absolutely, there are fats that are not healthy fats. Um, the <clears throat> vegetable oils are processed in a way that are very toxic and um, deep fried foods, do I need to say more? <laughs> That's not healthy. But the healthy fats are the organic butter or ghee, and ghee is just a clarified butter. It's been um, simmered and boiled so that the dairy aspect of it is gone, so it's just fat. And then some of the plant-based fats are the um, coconut oil, the um, olive oil, and avocado oil. Those are the three I use primarily. I like the avocado oil because it does not um, burn if you're cooking with it, whereas the olive oil you want to try to keep. Um, use just for salad dressings or low temperatures. I see you on the screen, Mike. Do you have any questions or are we good? I think we are all good, and I just that was it was a good note about the uh, olive oils there and, uh, and low temperature. I didn't know that. So. <laughs> yeah, there's um butter as well, butter ghee especially over butter. You can cook at quite high temperatures, so I like um, using that. Uh -huh. And like I said, we, uh, our brain is <clears throat> what the numbers are. We are always changing, but the number, but it's about seventy to eighty percent fat. And if we're not nourishing our brain with fat, we're struggling. Our brain is gonna really struggle. In fact, uh, they've used coconut oil in a lot of tests and studies for people with Alzheimer's. And they noticed very quickly that um, having coconut oil and just coconut oil, I'm not even talking about all, any other kind of oil, <clears throat> there was a vast improvement in their cognitive skills very quickly. So that's, um, that's pretty impressive. The other thing that we really need fats for is um, our hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHA. Those are all um, hormones that cannot be produced if we don't have fat in our diet. And so we see gymnasts and uh, ballerinas who have like zero body fat. They don't have normal cycles and they don't, you know, so... And that really wreaks havoc when they get older, when they get into menopause. Not that I mean, you have to worry about that right now, but um, it, it, there are consequences to not having uh, good fats in our diet. And I do want to emphasize good fats, right? Um, <clears throat> and of course, we need protein in our diet for muscle. And we can't, our body cannot store protein, so we have to have protein of some, of some kind on a daily basis because it, it can't store it. 
So now I'm going to give you the bad news. The bad news is, <laughs> while this may be a typical meal for a lot of people, and it certainly was for me for a long time, maybe not pop, but I loved fries and burgers and deep fried stuff. Um, I was actually a carb aholic, I would say. I loved pasta. I loved chocolate, like chocolate bars, the really bad ones, of course, the sugar. The good news is dark chocolate, 85% or more, is actually quite good for you. But I'll get there later. Uh, so if, if you look at this, it's the poisons. What are the poisons? Well, sugar and artificial substitutes, not just aspartame, but uh, sucralose and what are they, nutra something. Those are all very toxic. And unfortunately, a lot of our diabetic population started using aspartame because they were told that that was a better alternative. And while it did not spike their blood sugars, it actually created, it never satisfied their cravings. So they just ended up eating more sugar anyway. And it has a neurological effect on the brain. So sugar does, sugar totally affects your brain. And I think we've heard quite a bit how it will trigger the same part of your brain as heroin will trigger. So you can be totally addicted to it. And if you don't think you're addicted to sugar, try cutting it out of your diet for a while and see how quickly you start to go through withdrawals. Um, and the artificial sweeteners, GMOs, MSG, and aspartame, they're all chemicals that seriously damage your brain. And um, that's been seen time and time again. MSG, I've noticed for me now, aspartame gives me a headache almost instantly, and um, GMOs hurt my gut, and MSGs make it difficult for me to breathe. So I know that uh, for me, those are really bad. And while you may not experience symptoms when you're eating these foods, that doesn't mean that you're healthy. Um, often we think that if we're not experiencing certain symptoms that that means we're healthy, but that's not true. I mean, how often do people suddenly die of a heart attack? And up until that point, everyone thought they were really healthy. But that heart attack, it took 10 years to get to that. So um, having no symptoms is not an indication of good health. Uh, Corn-derived ingredients are horrible because 90% of our corn, unfortunately, is also genetically modified and there's um, lots of it, the ingredients, anything that's canned or in a box, uh, frozen, there's something that's corn-based in there. Refined carbs and gluten are, you know, like the hamburger there, the, the bread. Um, a funny little story with regards to that. I really don't eat this anymore, but I was on a motorcycle trip with my boyfriend a couple of years ago, and we were traveling across the states. And I'm very diligent about what I eat. I'm on the back of a motorcycle. I have to kind of stay awake. And unfortunately, twice through the trip, I, where we stopped to eat, I had no choice. I had to have some bread. And I tried to have just a little bit of it, but... Um, not even 15 minutes back on the bike, I could not stay awake. I'm slapping my face to try to stay awake and I've got the visor up and I'm singing really loud and I literally fell asleep on the back of the bike. I couldn't stay awake, it was the bread. And I wasn't sure at first, so I thought, what the heck? And then when I did it, then about three days later again, we were in the same situation, I had a little bit of bread and I was a lot and that same thing. So after that, okay, no more bread on this trip. Um, conversely, when I have I have um, water that I drink. It has greens in it. I don't know if you can see that. And um, that's better than coffee for me. If I'm traveling and I need to stay awake because I've had a long day, I have greens. It's a, just a, loaded with all kinds of good nutrients and superfoods. I can, I, I'm focused. I can drive. I can pay attention to the road. And it's way better than coffee. On that note, I also don't drink it before I go to bed or I'm only sleeping. So processed foods, we know what those are. Excessive alcohol and fed genetically modified foods. They're in a caged environment, not very healthy. And then, of course, meats that are industrialized. We know that um, they're loaded with antibiotics, hormones, all kinds of stuff. Again, all affects the brain. So um, other than the fish, I think that all of those ingredients are in that meal right there. 
even not the alcohol, but there might be alcohol in the sugar. So <laughs> there's caffeine in the pop. So all of those ingredients are in that beyond right there, which you know is unfortunate. I threw in that little quote, it's easier to change a man's religion, someone's religion than it is to change their diet, because man, we have a hard time changing our diets. We don't want to stop eating the foods that we love, right? But a big part of that is addiction. We don't realize how much we crave certain foods and how addicted we are to certain foods until we stop eating them. And then we realize, wow, I'm really addicted. Uh, Lise, can I interject just one moment? Yep. Uh, I said, uh, actually, my Zoom session just crashed and my chat feed went away, but I think there, there's one question from Hannah, and I think it was asking if you could uh, talk about what GMOs are and what MSG oh, is. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, see, I always assume that everybody knows these things by now. <laughs> so GMO is genetically modified food. Um, it has been uh, adulterated in many different ways in the lab, but the biggest issue with genetically modified foods, corn and soy are the two biggest crops that are genetically modified, is that um, they are what's called Roundup Ready. So what that means is that they get very, very heavily sprayed with Roundup or a chemical called, chemical called glyphosate. And the glyphosate, I mean, it is saturated. So it kills all of the weeds around the crops except the actual crop. And then the, it saturates the soil, goes into the roots of the plant, and then the plant is loaded with this glyphosate. So you can't wash it off. It is loaded with glyphosate. And um, I was just watching a documentary last night, talk, just talking about how um, it's impacting us globally because it's also in the air now, it's in the rainwater, and it's becoming more and more difficult to keep out of our diet even when we're eating better, healthier foods. And MSG is a food, monosodium glutamate is a food that has a million different names, so they hide it on different labels because you don't know what it is. And it's used in, in cooking for flavor. It's actually used by scientists in labs if they want to make their um, mice fat because <laughs> you gain weight eating it. Um, and again, it's a neurotoxin, so it affects our brain, and uh, it's something that we want to avoid. When I say neurotoxin, I'm always saying, I, I mean that it is something that will affect the neurons in our brain and makes our brain, it kills our, our neurotoxins. So that's, GMOs do the same thing and they both will create um, perforations in our, in our digestive lining, in our stomach and in our, in our gut that um, will then in turn cause all kinds of health issues to help. And I'm gonna go into that more one of the other sessions because it's something that I learned is that no amount of healthy eating is going to help you if you don't have a healthy gut um, because your gut is not going to process the food properly but I will get into that uh, I think if not next session the session after that so I hope that answered the question GMO and uh, MSG and yeah, that yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful, Lise, and thank you, Hannah, for posing that question. We do have another question that came in as well, but if we're going to reserve a couple minutes after your session, Lise, uh, we could we could do that. Up to you. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, I am almost done, so. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, Vipul, I'll ask your question just uh, in a couple of moments. Yep. So, um, I was talking about macronutrients and how we need macronutrients in our diet and a broad spectrum of those things. Um, the carbs that I have identified on the screen on the, on the PowerPoint as not being macronutrients, those are the wheat-based ones. They are the starches. Uh, simple carbs that break down into sugar into, in our diet, in our digestive system, sorry. Our body breaks it down as sugar. Uh, insulin is produced to deal with that sugar. And then, uh, because our body can only store a small amount of that sugar, then the rest gets converted to fat. So, um, it's not an essential nutrient. We have essential nutrients and non-essential. There are certain nutrients, certain amino acids, for example, that our bodies cannot produce. Essential means basically it's a nutrient that our body cannot produce on its own with, uh, without certain foods being put 
or, or eaten in our diet. So um, grains, we've only really had in our diet for a short period of time, as opposed to more of the plant-based and animal-based foods. Uh, we had grains certainly that were raw and whole, but now we're eating things that are processed that aren't at all similar to what we, our ancestors used to eat. So it's really affecting our digestive system. So the, the macronutrients that we do need uh, are in the proteins and the fats. The, there are certain amino acids in the proteins that we absolutely have to have in our diet for our bodies to, um, that we can't, let me try that again. There's certain amino acids that we need food for our bodies to produce what it needs to produce. And the same with fats, there's omega-3 fats that uh, it's called, they're called essential fatty acids. They are essential because we have to eat them. The two biggest sources are flaxseed oil, organic, and um, fish oil. The smaller the fish and filtered, the better. And while the fish has a higher quality of, or higher quantity, I guess I would say, of essential fatty acids, the flaxseed oil, the body will take the flaxseed oil and convert it into the essential fatty acids, but it needs a lot more of the flaxseed oil to convert it into the um, essential fatty acids that it needs, provided the digestive system is uh, functioning properly to do that. So I know people who are vegan have an adversity, you know, they, they don't really want to have um, fish oil, which is fine, and they're not going to eat fish, but that means they do really need to increase the flaxseed oil in their diet to, to have that essential fatty acid. Uh, huh. So, yeah, more bad news, right? We don't need, we don't need grains in our diet. So I was looking for some, um, just to give you an idea of quantity, what what should our diet kind of consist of? And whether it's vegan, and I pulled up, I found a Mediterranean diet. Um, regardless of either one, whether you're a vegetarian, vegan, or you're not, the first thing is always vegetables, right? Vegetables, then fruits, protein, whether that's animal-based or plant-based, those are the next. And then the uh, sugars, and grains as a kind of last. So that's what we want to have the least. Now that's not what our uh, Canadian food guide tells us we should have, uh, or the standard American diet. I hear that a lot. And I heard a quote recently that said, if you eat the standard American diet, you're going to get the standard American diseases and die the standard American death. It's, it's a very bad diet that um, unfortunately, it needs to change and it, it's very slow in coming and it is changing, but uh, science is always 20 years ahead of all of that. So <laughs> consider yourself 20 years ahead of everybody else. Um, and of course there's water. I haven't talked about water. I will be talking about water. Again, our, bo our body is 75% water, our brain as well. And if you want to do really well before a test, make sure you're well hydrated. It's been shown that um, water uh, really helps the brain to think and focus better. So after everything I've talked about, there are certainly, these are, this is not my list, this is um, Jim Quick. He uh, was, he had a brain injury when he was child, really struggled with studying. And so he came up with um, foods that are great for the brain. And all of these are specifically helpful for the brain. The avocado, coconut oil are good oils. The wild salmon, good oils. Walnuts have good oil in it as well. And walnuts are kind of funny. They, they look like a little mini brain, don't they? But they're also really good for the brain. Uh, blueberries are high in antioxidants. They help uh, with inflammation. Of course, broccoli and the, the greens are really good for your brain. Turmeric is an anti-inflammatory. Eggs are really good for your brain. Again, keep in mind if you're vegan, of course, you're not going to eat those, but there's still lots of plant based foods that you can have that are going to really be helpful for your brain. And of course, the water, dark chocolate, yay. When I have a craving for sugar now, 
Um, I go to dark chocolate, I have a piece or two, and I'm very satisfied. So the, the great thing about these foods is, as you can see, I um, have a picture of a smoothie, which you can make with avocado and blueberries, throw in a little bit of coconut oil, some water, maybe some turmeric walnuts, if they've been soaked overnight, will be nice and soft and blend in there. Or you can make yourself a salad. You just have one of these a day and you're going to see a huge difference with your cognitive, your thinking and, and your ability and your mood because what we eat so much affects our mood. Um, it's, I, I do little experiments on myself and kind of go like, so what happens if I eat this? And what happens if I do that? <laughs> and often I don't sleep at night um, because of that because I've, I've done some crazy things to my brain. So a uh, food, absolutely what you eat affects your gut, which directly affects your brain. And that's, um, now they, they understand today why there's a, a nerve called the vagus nerve that connects our digestive system to our brain, which in turn uh, connects to all of our organs and systems. So if we're not eating the right foods, it is going to have an impact on our gut. It is going to have an impact on our, on our brain. That's um, that's a given. That's that's what all the science says, and I know from my own experience that that's the case. So why do you want to to change what you eat? Well, like I just said, it's going to help the quality of um, your health, your brain, your body. So to give you as a as an athlete, there are lots of athletes who are vegan and who, um, <clears throat> don't have to have meat in their diet and they're they thrive and they, they are at the top of their game so um, there's lots of different ways of doing this so what are the benefits you're going to have improved focus and clarity you're going to have way more energy and endurance like i said if you're an athlete food can absolutely reduce anxiety and depression of course you're if you're eating well you're going to be at a more natural stable weight um, your sleep will be improved. You know, it improves your skin, helps with different skin conditions like psoriasis, and um, really reduces the, your, your mood swings. And for those of us who have cycles, it really makes those a lot less detrimental. Uh, so I don't, and of course, um, what happens when we eat the bad foods? Well, we get the total opposite. We don't have good focus and clarity. We don't have a lot of energy. We often have a lot of aches and pains. We're down, bummed out. You no, know, we're overweight. We're not sleeping well. Um, we break out in all kinds of acne and rashes, and, and we're just not feeling so great. So uh, why not try to do this? The, uh, the challenge, of course, is how do we transition? How, because to just decide, okay, I'm not going to eat all of this anymore, and I'm going to have just that, is tough. It's tough, and I don't even recommend it. I don't, uh, I think I've had one client who really wanted to re reverse his type 2 diabetes, and he, he did everything by the letter, by the book, and, you know, he reversed all of that, and I think inside of a month, but that's the exception. I always recommend that people start by adding good stuff into the diet. And if you want to reduce something, reduce one thing, um, not all of it. Reduce it slowly, eliminate it, and add more of the good stuff into your diet. And over time, what happens, two things happen. Our bodies actually start to crave the foods that are healthier for us. And we only have so much room on our plate to eat certain things. And if we eat just the healthier stuff first, then we don't have room for the other stuff anymore. So it's a, it's a natural transition. And there's a lot more, of course, that we can do, but that's a good place to start. So um, I'm just going to quickly go over the two handouts that I included, just, and then we can have lots of questions if, that's, if, that, if there are questions. Uh, the first thing that I provided for you, if I can find you so I can show you, is it's basically just, uh, it's color-coded. What are the foods that you can have the most of? What are the foods that you want to have in moderation and the foods that you want to avoid? If you see that you're eating mostly the foods you want to avoid, well, start incorporating some of the other ones. Kind of do a, a shift where you're slowly adding more of the other stuff. 
and um, and and just kind of monitor, see see where you're at, because you might be surprised that oh, okay, I'm I'm eating some of this good stuff. Ooh, I'm eating way too much of this not so good stuff. And just sometimes I find if when we're really conscious, and that's what this list does, is it makes us conscious of what we're eating, then we start paying more attention. Um, and then the other form is an assessment form for that reason. This is kind of a tracking form. I use it with my clients. But what it does is, is if they, they track what they've eaten, how their bodies respond to what they've eaten, if there's a reaction at all, their gas, bloating, headaches, how much are they drinking of water and other things, what's their mood, what's their craving like, how much sleep are you getting, how much exercise are you getting. And it, it's quite interesting when you start with something like this and then you start making some changes. And then um, you start assessing down the road and you realize that all of the challenges and uh, issues that you had aren't there anymore or they're minimized because you see the correlation between the food and how you're, um, how you're getting healthier. So um, I highly encourage you to, to fill it out, even if it's just for a couple of days, kind of track what you're eating right now and then down the road do the same thing again and, and to compare and, and you'll notice for sure the different the correlation with the food and how you're feeling now versus down the road. So I think that's about it. <clears throat> Let me uh, unshare this. <clears throat> then we can have some questions. Okay. Awesome. That's great, Lise. Um, I do realize, folks, uh, if you had only planned to be here for 40 minutes or so, uh, mm -hmm. if you have to go, no problem. We'll keep this mm -hmm. recording and I'll ask the questions that you have posed in the chat for Lise. And uh, yeah. Um, so Lise, I got three, I think, three questions for you. The first one is, let me just scroll up. Okay, so Vibel, I apologize if I said your name improperly, uh, says, I use brown sugar in tea. Is this better than white sugar? Also, should I substitute brown sugar with something more natural like honey? Um, so brown sugar is basically white sugar with molasses in it. Uh, unless you're using the cane sugar, but it is still sugar and sugar is going to spike our insulin and so i would actually suggest honey i that's what i use i like to put just a little bit of, of honey as opposed to some people might use um, maple syrup but honey is a better alternative and unpasteurized is definitely better um, and you don't need a whole lot because it is quite sweet so i really haven't noticed a difference in terms of flavor changing from um, sugar to honey. I've tried lots of different things. I don't like stevia is a good natural sweetener, but it has a funky little after taste that I don't like. So I, uh, I use honey and I've noticed that as I put less and less in that I, I need less and less. So okay. um, honey is definitely better for sure. So honey is a good substitute and stevia is also a safe substitute, but leaves up a little bit of a weird taste. Yeah, it just depends. Some people totally like it. And you have to be careful with stevia because if you look at when you're buying it, it'll say stevia on the box, but when you flip it over, it might be half stevia and half nature sweet or sucralose or something. So make sure that if you are getting stevia, that it's 100% pure stevia and not, um, and the, the, the key is probably the cost of this two side by side and one's half the price and one probably has nature sweet or something in it. Very good to know. But okay. Yeah. A long way too. You only need a tiny bit of stevia to sweeten things. So. Okay. Okay. So from Hannah, we have are carbs bad? I was told they're good depending on how much you eat of carbs. Yeah. So carbs is always the big thing, right? Um, and again, it's the difference between simple carbs and bad carb and and complex carbs. Simple carbs skyrocket your insulin because, like I said, the simple carbs convert. Um, can get converted into glucose, which is sugar. Your body has to produce lots of insulin to process that, and most of the time, uh, a small amount gets stored, and then the rest gets put on our bodies um, with, in, in the form of fat. So uh, I know we've been told that it's good for us, but the reality is that if you're going to have it small quantities and really have more of the vegetables and fruits, which are the complex carbs, and they don't spike our blood sugar the same way because there's fiber in it that um, 
minimizes that response. And I also usually recommend uh, when people are going to have fruit, for example, because fruit has more, naturally more sugar in it, that they have it with some form of protein, whether that's nuts or peanut or nut butter or boiled egg or something. And that really also minimizes the insulin um, spike that, that we might get with, with fruit. But insulin spike with fruit versus insulin spike with um, a simple carb is completely different um, because with fruit, it spikes and then goes back down quickly, whereas with a simple carb, it spikes and stays spiked for a long time. So that's the, the difference. Okay. That makes that makes sense. You illustrated that well. Okay, uh, from Monica, let me scroll up. Um, so, what you're advising uh, seems like the keto diet. Is that what you're advocating? Uh, I really don't like to. Eat. Um, there are a million people doing the keto diet in a million different ways, and I have done workshops on the keto diet, but I always call it the keto diet the green way because too much fat is too much fat. And a lot of people, their idea of, of the keto diet is um, way too much protein. Yes, a lot of fat, but a lot of animal uh, fat, which is, can be very inflammatory. So I promote a lot more of the, I, I prefer to see people have a lot more of the um, plant-based fats and lots of vegetables. Where, um, and keto diets kind of, there's three different levels, the hardcore one, the kind of medium and then the, the, the low to moderate one. And while what I'm advocating is similar to keto, um, I would say it's not entirely. Um, a true keto diet, like the hardcore one, is very hard to sustain long term. And depending on where you're getting your protein, how much you have, and the fats, sources of your fats, um, you might get Good results initially but long term in terms of your health um, not so much so it, it's similar to keto i would say but um but i would not call it a keto keto diet no okay that's awesome okay so we have one more question and we'll we'll end it after that uh but bikramjeet has a question about intermittent fasting what yeah. is your opinion on intermittent fasting I love intermittent fasting. That's one of the things we will be talking about. Um, it's something that everyone can incorporate into their lifestyle because it is, it's very flexible. And so depending, and I, I'll get into detail uh, on how to do that. In one of the sessions, I'm not sure which one, but I am going to get into detail because it really helps um, your brain to reboot, reset, and it, it surprisingly, a lot of athletes use it as well for workouts, and they're more the brain is more clear. They can think better. They're more focused. They're more creative. There's lots of benefits to intermittent fasting. I mean, let's face it: our ancestors didn't eat three meals a day with snacks in between. They ate when they could. They ate well, and then they it might be um, 24 hours before they ate again until they had more food. So. Um, we're, our bodies are actually really designed for intermittent fasting, but what that looks like, the beauty of that, is that it's, um, it's very easy to adapt into our, into our lifestyle. Um, so it's very flexible, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So there's uh, lots of benefits to it, for sure. Great. Well, there, there's your answer, uh, Bikramjeet, and it's safe and it's good. Uh, and, and Lisa's going to touch on it again in one of our future sessions uh, to bring some more information, so stay tuned for that. It uh, looks like all of the questions here have been posed. If anyone would like to unmute and ask a question now, that's okay too. I'm going to stop the recording shortly, uh, but uh, I know we're a little longer than we normally would be on these sessions, but that was just because of the first one. We started a bit late, and uh, we appreciate everybody for sticking, sticking with us. This was a great first session. Yes, thank you very much for everyone who attended. It, it's, um, I'm glad there were some faces here and not just mine. <laughs> 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 oh, amazing okay jen says thank you uh looks like that's it for questions um yeah uh if if anyone uh, is here that didn't register please access on us on the website email me we'll get you that information pack to you as well but uh yeah thank you Bible. thank you monica i apologize for the scheduling error and i uh, look forward to seeing you all in two weeks 
And for sure, if you have any questions that you have between now and the next session, when you're thinking about this stuff, send me, me or Mike an email on, and I'll be happy to, uh, to respond. I can email you back the response. Amazing. That's great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Shauna. Vic Ravid again. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you, Caroline. Awesome. Great. Right. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful Thanks. day. You too.